Hi, and welcome to episode 3 of Comics Crash Course. History marches on, and so do we, right to the birth of print culture, which leads us to the cusp of modern comics. So if we're going to talk about print culture, that means we need to discuss one of the most significant moments in history, Johannes Gutenberg's invention of the printing press in 1440 CE. Now, Gutenberg wasn't actually the first person to invent a printing press or even the first person to invent movable type. Woodblock printing existed in China for at least, well, 700 years before this, and it had been popular in Europe for over 100 years before Gutenberg. But while woodblock printing only allows uh, printing of one pre-carved page or a section of text at a time, movable type is different. A printer sets individual letter pieces into words and lines to create a form, and then sets this into a press. Once the project is done, those letters and the press can be reused for different projects. But even movable type had been invented before Gutenberg, in China, again, uh, around 1040 CE. So why does Gutenberg get the credit? Well, for one thing, white folks tend to ignore everything happening outside of Europe. But there are genuine innovations in Gutenberg's press. He combined the reusability of movable type with a newly mechanized version of a screw press to create a new printing process. Therefore, multiple pages set with movable type could be prepared ahead of time. One page could be inked, printed, and then switched out to the next page quickly and relatively easily. And the results on the culture were massive. Because books were now much more widely available, due to being much easier to print, and not the one-of-a-kind creations of scribes, more people could read them. And since more people could, more people did, leading to a huge leap in literacy rates. Hand in hand with this increase in literacy was a movement away from Latin towards uh, the increase of local vernacular languages, meaning that people would read and write in English, French, German, Italian, etc., instead of just in Latin. This rise in literacy led to the creation not just of books, but of other kinds of print media, particularly for our purposes, newspapers. The first newspaper in Europe appeared in Germany in 1605, and this was followed shortly by successful papers in the Netherlands, France, Portugal, and Spain. Amsterdam, in particular, became a hub for printing newspapers, and it was where the first English-language paper was printed in 1620. In fact, the first recorded daily newspaper printed in England wouldn't debut until 1702. And the first regularly published U.S. newspaper, the Boston Newsletter, appeared in 1704. Now, alongside newspapers, broadsheets, or broadsides, became a popular form of print media. These were, like newspapers, ephemera. They were meant to be consumed, read, and thrown away, not kept like books. These were large, often two by two and a half feet. Some were printed on a single side and meant to be posted. These were broad sides. And others were printed on both sides. These were broad sheets. Unlike newspapers, they were frequently used for royal announcements or governmental edicts, um, but often ended up becoming places for political discourse, like, oh, say this one. And often as well for sensationalist propaganda. Sometimes they were even used for folklore, um, to record ballads and song lyrics and the like. So why are we talking about broadsheets? Well, because of their size and often uh, extreme nature and content, broadsheets and illustrations were natural companions. And as David Kunzel points out in a ton of detail in his book, The Early Comic Strip, many of these illustrations ended up looking very much like comic strips. Take, for example, Francis Barlow's 1682 broadsheet, A True Narrative of the Horrid Hellish Popish Plot. It has panels, captions and boxes, and even early versions of speech balloons, which were often called banderoles at this point. Now, this is tabloid stuff. Anti-Catholic sentiment in particular inspired a lot of propaganda throughout the 16 and 1700s. But there's stranger stuff too, like this piece inspired by the Mary Toft Affair. In case you don't know, this is a woman who had convinced the king's own doctor that she had been giving birth to litters of rabbits. That particular story was salacious enough to inspire the printmaker William Hogarth as well. Now, Hogarth was an insanely popular artist at the time, whose work was satirical and often politically tinged. He was known for works like, and I'm sorry for the title, A Harlot's Progress, a series of sequential paintings he made that became so popular he decided to engrave them in 1731 and sell them as a series of prints. 
The engravings were so popular, people started forging them, and as a result, Hogarth lobbied Parliament to change copyright laws to extend to engravings. He would go on to do two nearly as popular sequels, and one of them, A Rake's Progress, the painting set still hangs in the John Sloan Museum in London, a kind of one-of-a-kind comic strip, paintings and sequence. Now, Hogarth was satirical and often politically tinged, but he saw himself primarily as a fine artist. However, between the politically explicit illustrations in the broadsides and Hogarth's politically satirical prints, the first explicitly political cartoonists, as we think of them today, begin to appear around 1750, particularly in prints and in humor magazines. These satirical and explicitly political illustrations begin in the latter half of the 18th century and are spearheaded in particular by English cartoonists like James Gilray, Thomas Rowlandson, and eventually George Cruikshank. Editorial cartooning would be cemented in newspapers as a way to comment in particular on the French Revolution. But political and editorial cartooning truly found its home in humor and satire magazines, which would be founded in the 1830s. One of the most important early titles was a French magazine called Le Charivari, but perhaps the most influential humor magazine is Punch, or the London Charivari, founded in 1841. What makes it so important? Well, for one, I've been using the word cartoon, haven't I? That's thanks to Punch. You see, in 1843, the English Parliament was going to hold an exhibition of paintings and murals as a way to celebrate having been rebuilt after a big fire in 1834. Artists were supposed to submit cartoons from the Italian word cartone. The original meaning of the word was a preliminary drawing for a work of art. They would then choose the final works of art to exhibit from those cartoons. At the time, the most popular part of Punch was a full-page satirical drawing known as the Big Cut entitled Mr. Punch's Pencilings. But in July of 1843, the big cut was replaced for the week by the magazine's own cartoon, John Leach's Cartoon Number no. 1, Substance and Shadow. Leach decided to make fun of Parliament because London at the time, if you've read any Dickens, was a city that was struggling with extreme poverty. He wanted to contrast the sumptuousness of the parliamentary exhibit with the miserable poverty of the starving population, claiming that the government had, quote, Determined that as they cannot afford to give the hungry nakedness the substance which it covets, at least it shall have the shadow. The poor ask for bread, and the philanthropy of the state accords an exhibition. The word cartoon stuck, and has become associated with political satire, and eventually with any kind of humorous drawing. And now we use it for that exclusively, and not in the previous sense of the term. The popularity of Punch signaled the beginning of a huge industry of satire magazines. And not only in the UK, it spread to the USA. By the latter half of the century, the creation of magazines like Harper's Weekly, which was founded in 1857, Puck in 1877, Judge in 1881, and Life magazine, which was also founded as a humor and satire magazine in 1883. Now, while all of this was going on, a teacher in Switzerland started publishing some of his funny books that he'd been making to entertain his students, books many scholars call the first comics. That's what we'll start next week. See you then.